Texas Prison Story family. Salute y'all. It's your boy, Tim Snow. Back here with another one. You see what the topic is. I swear to God, there's so much confusion. It's unbelievable. So many men still supporting this guy. So many men saying free the mix. So many men doing all this weird stuff. I would like you men to come explain yourself. When you say free the mix, does that mean you touch little kids too? Does that mean you don't believe he touched little kids? Or does that just mean you don't care that he touched little kids? This is the explanation we want. When you say free the mix, you need to start saying why. You let us know what you got going on in your mind when you say free the mix, because we can't understand it down here. And we help his ass stay locked up. We got children. Well, a man in Texas that had a lot of money to hire any attorney he wanted, do anything he needed to beat his case. But instead of doing all that and beating his case, he went out on bond and had sex with another 14 year old. Your hero is straight trash, y'all. I hate to tell you. If that man is your hero, you're something just like him. And I need you to unsubscribe to my channel. Look at this. Carlos Coy versus the state of Texas appeal. Carlos Coy versus the state of Texas appeal E. Appellant Carlos Coy was charged with aggravated sexual assault of a child. The jury found appellant guilty and assessed a punishment of 45 years confinement and a fine in the amount of $10,000. We affirm, means they agree. In eight points of error, appellant complains about the following. The prosecutor's closing arguments, certain testimony by a police officer, certain testimony by a state's expert, and the refusal of the trial judge to squash the indictment. Here's the background to the case. In September 2001, the then nine-year-old complainant told her mother about sexual acts that Pellin had performed on her. The mother took her daughter to the authorities who began an investigation of the complainant's allegations. The evidence at trial showed the appellant's daughter had, been, had invited the complainant to spend the night at the appellant's home on September 1, 2001. Both children were watching television in the appellant's bedroom when appellant entered room and began watching television with the children. While sitting on the bed, appellant inappropriately touched and rubbed her. After this incident, the complainant left appellant's bedroom. The children eventually entered the daughter's bedroom. Both climbed into the bed and began watching television. After appellant's daughter fell asleep, appellant entered the room, sat on the bed, reached under the covers, and again, and again inappropriately touched her. Eventually, appellant sexually assaulted the complainant by causing her sexual organ to come in contact with his mouth. The complainant testified that appellant persisted in this concept for approximately one minute. The complainant did not, after this incident, incident stay overnight at appellant's home as was originally planned, but returned home. The following morning, she informed her mother what occurred at appellant's house, and the authorities were contacted to investigate the incident. Points of error one, two, and three in his first three points of error. Appellate contends that the trial court erred when it overruled his objections to the prosecutor's statements and closing arguments. In his first point of error, appellate complains about the following statement. I don't know what that has to do with anything. That's just another thing that they're putting out there hoping that one of us buys it. That's all they have to do. One of you think there's any credibility to any of these crazy theories because they don't want you to look at the evidence and truth. Our job as prosecutors is to seek the truth. That's not his job. His job is to represent Carlos Coy. And that's what Carlos was so upset about. I don't see much wrong with that. I have an objection in the trial court to the above statement was, Your Honor, I'm going to object. My job is the same as theirs. In his second point of error, appellate contends that the trial court erred when it refused to sustain his objection to the prosecutor's statement and closing arguments that his job is to represent Carlos Coy, keeping him from going to jail. That's what he gets paid to do. The other prosecutors and me get paid. 
Appellant's objection in the trial court to these statements was, I'm going to object, Your Honor. The state of Texas gets paid just like I do. Improper argument. In his third point of error, appellant contends that the trial court erred when it overruled his objections to the prosecutor. Oh, I'm sorry, I just read that. And I can tell you we've got enough work to do without having to manufacture a case. We don't care that he's a rapper or a musician. Appellant's objection to the trial court to the above statement was, Your Honor, I'm going to object. The personal feelings are improper. On appeal, appellant contends that these statements are outside the record, manifestly in improper and pre prejudicial. An objection at trial must correspond with the argument on appeal, and this court may not consider grounds raised before the court. Look, right here where my cursor is. We overrule the first three points. That means he was wrong. His appeal was not valid. Point of error four. In his fourth point of error, appellant contends that the trial court erred when it refused to sustain his objection to testimony from Officer Ruiz, the lead police investigator that complainant made outcry statements to another non-testifying witness. The following, the following exchange took place in the court trial. Prosecutor, okay, from what the complainant told you, Fiona, was that consistent with what she had told you just three days before? Objection, Your Honor, hearsay. Overruled. You may answer that question. The officer said it's absolutely consistent with everything they told me. So literally, they're trying to get the officer to say that they changed stories, and he's saying, no, three days later, they told me the exact same story. So look, appellant urges that this statement contributed, constituted hearsay and does not comply with Article 38.072 of the Texas Code. The state does not dispute that the requirements of Article 38072 were not satisfied. It argues that admission of these statements were harmless because the state had previously, without an objection, introduced evidence that proved the same facts. So it's fourth one, bad denied. At the time of trial, at the time the trial court ruled that the admissibility of the disputed testimony the jury had already heard the complainant testify without objection that she had been interviewed by the police station by Officer Ruiz and that she told Ruiz in the interview that appellant touched her and licked her. The complainant also testified that she was interviewed at the Children's Assistance Center and that during this interview, she informed the interviewer that appellant touched her and licked her and described the location on her body where appellant had touched and licked her. Officer Ruiz testified that she was present at the interview, which was conducted by Fiona Stevenson. It is well established that the improper admission of evidence does not constitute, constitute reversible error in the same facts proved by other properly admitted evidence. That's denied. And his, his fourth claim, invalid. In his fifth point of error, Appellant contends the trial court erred by allowing state expert Susan something to testify that she did not see the complainant exhibit any signs of coaching. The state argues that appellant waived error because defense counsel stated prior to the hearing that he had no objections specifically to the expert's qualifications. Number two, defense counsel did not state the specific ground for his objections to the state testifying expert and the specific ground was not apparent for the context. Number three, Defense counsel did not object at the earliest opportunity when the state's experts testified. That one didn't work. Fifth point of error, waved off, didn't make a difference, I guess. The following exchange took place during the Daubert hearing. Look, Your Honor, for the purposes of brevity, I'm familiar with prior testimony. I don't have any objections specifically as to her qualifications. If we could just have the prosecution elicit what opinions he may give about this case, that may conclude to necessity for a Daubert hearing. Of course, it's okay. She's an expert. Go ahead. Like he literally just admitted she was an expert, his own attorney. State going to her opinions. The court, yes. So look at this. This is him right here. His attorney agreeing that she was a an expert, and that she showed no signs of coaching. Wow. They would have been a lot smarter just saying she's not an expert and, and fighting that. 
Although defense counsel conceded that the state's expert was qualified to testify about children victimized by sexual abuse, defense counsel did not concede that the state's expert was qualified to render, render an opinion on a specific topic of coaching. Okay, so literally, yeah, they said she's an expert, but then tried to pick that apart and say, but not on coaching. Wow. Furthermore, during the Daubert hearing, defense counsel questioned the state's expert with respect to her opinions on coaching and objected to the opinions she intended to give regarding the case. As a basis for his objection, defense counsel asserted that the expert's testimony would be unreliable. We hold that appellant preserved error with respect to point of error five. Oh, so may, maybe take that one. Standard of review. We will not disturb a trial court's determination that a witness is or not qualified as an expert unless a clear abuse of discretion is shown. So they're saying she's still an expert. Here's the analysis. A public contends testimony of the state's expert witness is unreliable because the state wholly failed to satisfy Daubert's predicate with respect to her testimony regarding coaching. Hernandez versus the state. We reviewed the pertinent case law in order to clarify the standard of reliability applicable to the case and the general confusion surrounding Daubert and its Texas progeny. So there's confusion about the, even the damn case. That's crazy that the, the case law. Expert testimony regarding the effect of sexual abuse on children is non-scientific expert testimony. Because Daubert factors do not necessarily apply outside of the hard science context we applied the test described, which required that in determining whether non-scientific non -scientific expert testimony is reliable and therefore admissible. We determine whether the expert's field of expertise is a legitimate one and whether coaching is within the scope of the expert's field of expertise. Number three, whether the expert's testimony properly relied upon or utilize the principles in her field. With respect to the first element of the test, both the Court of Criminal Appeals and the Court have recognized her as an expert. See there, this is crazy. Regarding whether the subject matter of her testimony was within the scope of her field, she testified that her opinions were based upon her experience as a therapist and supervisor at the Children's Assessment Center were to some extent based upon the knowledge she gained from reading pertinent literature throughout her career. She testified that coaching is a term that describes another individual trying to get a child to tell a certain story in a certain way, and that although she has reviewed articles on coaching, her opinion as to whether an individual had been coached was based primarily upon her experience. She also testified that she is familiar with the conduct that a child who had been coached would exhibit. She has a master's degree in social work is licensed by the state of Texas and has an advanced clinical practitioner's credential and is qualified to diagnose depression. She has practiced at the Children's Assessment Center, a multidisciplinary program that provides services to children who have been sexually abused for 10 years. During her first seven years as a therapy at the Children's Assessment Center, she saw approximately 50 children per year. And during the past three years, she's seen 20 to 30. The court does agree that she was in the scope of her field. They also conclude that her testimony properly relied on and utilized the principles involved in the field. She testified during the Daubert hearing that she was in part basing her conclusions on articles she had read concerning coaching, but primarily on her 10 years of experiment, experience as a therapist. Her opinions regarding coaching and other common characteristics of sexually abused children and the physical symptoms they exhibit are based primarily upon her experience derived providing therapy to hundreds of abused children. Let's get on past that one, dog. That's weak. You're sick. You're five was defeated. She's an expert. You admitted it. There goes six. The state contends that appellant waived error with respect to the six point of error because defense counsel failed to object at the earliest opportunity when the state's expert testified at trial that the complainant experienced headaches and stomach aches, which were consistent with sexual abuse. We agree. To preserve error, appellant must object at the earliest opportunity and continue to object each time the objectionable evidence is offered. So literally, they're saying they agree, but his lawyer did not object every single time like he's supposed to. Look, now in determining, I guess, her level of functioning, did you find out whether or not she was exhibiting any symptoms 
witness. She was having an increased difficulty in sleeping since the abuse had happened. She had previous problems with sleeping, but since the abuse, the sleeping problems had worsened. She had trouble falling asleep at night. She had trouble staying asleep at night. She talked about having nightmares. She talked about her mother also talked about that she was a lot more sensitive than usual, cried a lot more easily, became angry a lot more easily. She also complained of a lot of some semantic complaints, stomach aches, nausea, continuing headaches, those types of things. Were those symptoms typical of what you might expect from a person who's been sexually abused? The expert said, yes, those symptoms are consistent with sexual abuse. So fucking you sick, nasty fucking men, pay attention. Sorry ass bastards. It's causing fucking stomach aches, nausea, continuing headaches. Women can't sleep. They can't eat. And you sick motherfuckers still keep doing this shit. When appellant failed to object to her opinion at this time, he waived any challenge to her qualifications to render an opinion on whether the symptoms exhibited by the complainant were because of sexual abuse. We overruled the appellant's sixth point of error. <laughs> Number six, you're out of there, boy. Here goes seven and eight. Last chances. His freedom depends on seven and eight. Y'all, what's going to happen? Let's see. Kind of think I know what's going to happen here. In his seventh point of error, appellant contends the trial court erred by denying his motion to quash the indictment because the indictment did not allege that the appellant knew the complainant was younger than 17 years age at the time of the incident. So look, <laughs> here we go back to that old bullshit. He's straight saying he didn't know how old she was. But he was dating her mom and she stayed the night with his daughter. But here he goes literally saying, I did not notice she was under 17. You ask yourself as a human being, could you identify the difference between a nine-year-old girl and a 17-year-old girl? Answer me that in the comments. That's unfucking believable In his eighth point of error, appellant contends the trial court erred by denying appellant's jury instructions, which would require the jury to find in order to convict appellant that he knew the complainant was younger than 17 years old. Okay. So his last hope, number eight, was just him straight lying, saying, I had no idea how old she was. But would you let a 17-year-old girl spend a night with your six-year-old daughter? Get real, man. You knew how old that girl was. But he's used that excuse for several times. He didn't know how old the stripper was, although he was taking her back and forth to junior high and proposed to her. He didn't know how old this girl was, although she was spending the night with his six-year-old. He literally got caught on bond having sex with another 14-year-old, claiming he didn't know how old she was. Well, what the hell's wrong with you, man, that you ain't checking? What's wrong with your reasonable, your reasonability, your sense as a man to identify a, a, an adult and a child? One or two years, maybe, bro. But we're talking nine and 17, and you're right here claiming you didn't know the difference. Wow. Let's see what the court said. The Court of Criminal Appeals has held that in cases involving the sexual assault of a child, the state is not required to prove the defendant knew the victim was younger than 17 years age. Right there. Vasquez versus the state means it makes no fucking difference, Carlos Coy. And you still tried to run that again because your lawyer missed that case law. Unbelievable. This is hard to read. <coughs> Excuse me. No scientist would respect to the lack of consent and sexual assault. An aggravated sexual assault is required when the victim is a child. Straight up, man. The victim is a child. You can't claim you thought she was 17, you piece of shit. The 14th Court of Appeals ended directly addressed the issue in Jackson versus the state. In Jackson, the pilot was convicted of aggravated sexual assault of a child. The trial court instructed the jury on the lesser included offense of sexual assault of a child, in addition to the charge offense of aggravated of sexual assault of a child. So that's it, y'all. That was his eight chances. 
the first seven didn't even have a leg to stand on. Got eight alive by the fucking judges. And number eight was the cold ass lie. If you fucking see this video and you make it to where you get to number eight and you still support this man, hit unsubscribe and get away from my channel.